sixth um, lecture series of the type of um, this is the EAS invited lecture series in bilingualism and multilingualism. And the series is organized jointly by the Institute for Advanced Studies in Social Studies and Humanities, by the Faculty of English at Dada Mickiewicz University in Poznan, and by the Poznan branch of Bilingualism Matters. And together with my colleague, Professor Anna Evert, we have convened this academic year, a series of open lectures, eight open lectures. And uh, we've been honored that um, outstanding researchers and distinguished scholars in the field have accepted our invitations. So today it's our great pleasure and honor to welcome Professor Lee Wei from um, UCL London. And um, I'd like to ask now um, Anna to welcome our guests and introduce him. Yes, Professor Lee Wei is <clears throat> Director and Dean of the U UCL Institute of Education and Chair of Applied Linguistics at University College London. He is an elected fellow of the British Academy, member of Academia Europea, fellow of the British Academy of Social Sciences and fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. He is a sociolinguist by training and his contribution to the field of bilingualism is enormous. Uh, his research centers around different aspects of bilingualism and multilingualism, including, among others, the acquisition of multiple languages in childhood, family language policy, education policy and practice regarding bilingual and multilingual learners of minoritized and transnational backgrounds, cognitive benefits of language learning, and impact of bilingualism and social cognition on social cognition and creativity. He is the author of the term and concept of translanguaging, which has dominated, dominated the field recently. So this is by way of uh, introducing the speaker. And now, Professor Li Wei, it's over to you. Thank you so much for that really generous introduction. Let me just share my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, it's wonderful to be here uh, today. Uh, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Excellent. I'll just do the uh, display function. Uh, yes, thank you uh, for that introduction. And uh, as Anna said, uh, I have worked on different aspects of uh, bilingualism and multilingualism. I'm essentially interested in the phenomena of contacts between different named languages and the uh, result uh, of that contact on uh, the language uh, structure, but also the implications for uh, social interaction. So it is very much that uh, uh, interactions between different uh, uh, languages, if you like, as, as, as uh, uh, structural entities that I'm interested in. But uh, recently I've been taking a um, more social and, and applied linguistics uh, uh, perspective, looking at different alternatives uh, of looking at this phenomena of uh, language uh, mixing and various uh, other uh, phenomena in uh, language contact. And I've been using the uh, uh, term translanguaging as a possible alternative approach. Today, I'm going to talk about translanguaging in the sense of translanguaging uh, the concept of the notion of language, how we understand as language. I, I think fundamentally, we want to use, or I want to use translanguaging as a way of reflecting on our understanding of what language is. And with that, I'm also uh, looking at how um, translanguaging impacts on education, especially language education, but a, a bit broader than language education. We've, we want to find alternative ways of thinking, uh, uh, talking, and, uh, and, and doing uh, education. So, um, in some sense, the term translanguaging is part of this uh, growing uh, phenomena and growing uh, um, uh, interest in uh, lots of 
trans things, transnational, transcultural, transdisciplinary, transgender, etc. And trans is, in, is a part of that um, a trend, if you like. And uh, when I do uh, talks like this, I, I get uh, asked very often and certainly get asked by my students all the time, what is translanguaging? Now, that's actually quite a difficult question because I think it's, it's uh, when, when, when people ask that question, they're seeking a definition uh, and a definition of uh, a phenomena uh, or, or, or an object. Uh, but from uh, my point of view, at least, I think that's the wrong question, or at least it's not the, quite the right way of asking the question, because from the very moment the term was created, and I, I'm going to go into that in a minute, translanguaging was not regarded as a thing in itself. It's not like here is the example, or here is the phenomena, and that is translanguaging as opposed to something else. It's not an object to discover or to describe. It's very much analytical perspective. Some would say it's an ideological and political perspective. And again, I'm going to come to that uh, in a minute. So, so today's talk, uh, I'm going to first uh, review the um, origins and development of the concept of translanguaging and I'm going to then talk about translanguaging and language learning and language education. In particular I'm going to focus on uh, um, co-learning and pedagogy of vulnerability relate, uh, related to uh, language uh, education in particular. And I will uh, conclude with uh, some practical uh, challenges or, or, or solutions to these practical challenges. Uh, and again, the kind of common concerns from uh, practitioners, especially, especially language teachers. So, um, <laughs> excuse me, in terms of the history, of the concept of translanguaging. I'm, I'm slightly distracted right now because uh, uh, London has just started snowing, can you believe it? I can see quite heavy snow uh, outside my window. It's uh, unbelievable. Um, anyway, uh, coming back to the history of uh, the concept of translanguaging, um, there are broadly two uh, uh, routes to uh, the concept of translanguaging uh, within each a broad um, uh, approach or broad uh, um, uh, historical roots. Uh, there are two uh, kind of slightly subtle, uh, different uh, roots as well. Uh, one of the broad, two broad roots to translanguaging is pedagogical approach to bilingual education. And that's where it started. And many of you know by now very well that uh, it was Ken Williams uh, um, in his, um, uh, uh, 1994 uh, doctoral thesis. Ken Williams was a very experienced uh, a teacher and a teacher trainer in Wales, uh, where revitalization, Welsh revitalization program was uh, very active and he was very much involved in that. And he did a, a, a doctoral uh, thesis uh, on uh, uh, Welsh revitalization uh, programs and use this Welsh term, I won't try to pronounce it, to describe the phenomena that he was uh, observing. And it was later on his uh, English uh, supervisor, doctor supervisor, Colin Baker, um, uh, who used the uh, uh, term uh, initially, actually he called it translinguifying, and then uh, uh, turned it into translanguaging in the textbook Foundations of Bilingual Education and Bilingualism, now gone into a uh, uh, sixth uh, edition, very uh, popular textbook that introduced this concept to the uh, wider world as it were. Now, what Ken Williams was describing was a pedagogical practice where one receives information from one from the medium of one language, in this case, English, uh, and gives uh, um, uh, information through the medium of a different uh, language, Welsh. Now, basically it was a Welsh revitalization uh, uh, program. It, this is not a language uh, education program. This is, this is very much content-based, therefore to uh, um, 
um, revitalize uh, Welsh in diff in, with, with different content. Um, so it was really a Welsh medium instruction kind of uh, a context, if you like. But uh, there is no monolingual Welsh speaker, as uh, I'm sure you know. Uh, all Welsh speakers are also bilingual in English, at least. Uh, so the uh, when when the teacher uh, as a school policy dictates, uh, try to teach in Welsh, and has the Welsh re revitalization idea, uh, the pupils quite naturally uh, responded in English because that's their kind of uh, um, everyday uh, language um, uh, of, of uh, everyday uh, communication. Now, this, this is also a practice both by uh, teachers and the, uh, and, and the pupils, the, the, the students and the teachers, because sometimes they have to read certain material uh, in English because not everything uh, was available in, in Welsh, but uh, the teacher would try to encourage uh, the discussion to be in, in Welsh. Now, rather than seeing this kind of phenomena as a barrier to learning, obviously against school policy, because the school policy was to promote Welsh. Uh, Ken Williams actually argue, argued very uh, strongly and convincingly that this phenomena that Colin Baker later called translanguaging helps to maximize the learner's bilingual ability in learning. So the goal is on learning, the goal isn't on anything else. And these uh, uh, pupils are bilingual, so we need to recognize them and respect their bilingual ability and to maximize their bilingual ability by using both languages in the process of learning uh, it must be regarded as a as a positive thing. So that's that's um, uh, Cam Williams' argument as an effective pedagogical practice where the school language or the language of instruction is different from languages of the learner. So that's very much the, the context of, of that uh, uh, concept initially. So this, this pedagogical practice can break the ideological uh, uh, boundaries or divides between indigenous versus immigrant, major versus minor, target versus mother tongue languages in different contexts. And this is how uh, people like Ophelia Garcia, like uh, Angela Chris and Adrian Blackledge took the concept of translanguaging to different contexts, both the education of bilingual minoritized and racialized bilingual learners in the United States and also uh, immigrant and uh, uh, bilingual or English as a, an additional language learners in the United Kingdom and right across Europe. So translanguaging is seen to be empowering both the learner and the teacher and aims to transform the power relations and focuses very much on the process, uh, um, uh, or focus the process of learning and te uh, uh, teaching on meaning making, on making meaning through uh, uh, multiple languages, whilst enhancing uh, their multilingual multicultural experience, as well as developing multilingual and multicultural identity. And these are really important aspects of that argument. So as, as you can see from day one, as I mentioned earlier, translanguaging was not conceived as an object or linguistic structural phenomena to describe and analyze. It's not a thing in, in itself. This is something uh, really needs to be uh, emphasized. It's a process, it's a practice and a process. A practice that involves dynamic and functionally integrated use of different languages and language varieties as well through different modalities. Yeah, later on we'll see uh, uh, multimodalities um, uh, is a really important concept here uh, and very relevant to uh, uh, translanguaging because again, you know, from day one when Cam Williams described the uh, phenomena in in these Welsh 
revitalization classrooms, it was very much the four modalities that he was uh, considering the cross modalities, listening, speaking, reading and writing, uh, uh, different uh, modes of communication. And it's also a process of knowledge construction that goes beyond, this is the idea of trans, transcending, boundaries of named languages and i'll come to that uh, in a bit more detail in a minute now when it is applied to uh, to the learning of additional languages whether you call it second language or foreign language or whatever uh, we have to remind ourselves of the purpose of learning these languages, additional uh, languages what is the purpose of learning additional languages well it is clearly uh, to become bilingual and multilingual, not to replace our first language. Nobody in their right mind um, would think, okay, I am learning a foreign language or a second language. Uh, the goal is to forget my first language or forget my mother tongue, and then I'm going to switch entirely to that language. But this is to you know, uh, to, to um, add value to one's existing linguistic repertoire. So to become bilingual, multilingual is the goal of foreign language education uh, and uh, foreign language learning or second language learning. But it is actually quite rare uh, for in the in the uh, additional language or foreign language or second language uh, learning uh, context for bilinguals and multilinguals to be used as the model or the target for teaching and learning. It is quite often, actually more often than not, um, the monolingual native L1 speaker that is still the target and the model. Yeah, and the native speaker uh, uh, concept always assumes that the person uh, is monolingual. If you're bilingual, somehow you, 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 you are not normally uh, uh, described as, as uh, uh, native uh, because you, you, you are assumed to be only uh, uh, native in one uh, language at a time. There are all sorts of uh, uh, funny associations um, with a concept like uh, the native speaker. Anyway, uh, what do bilinguals and multilinguals typically do? So if we think actually we, we should be modeling uh, um, uh, second language acquisition or second language learning or foreign language learning on the bilinguals and multilinguals rather than the monolingual, because it's, 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 it shouldn't be the, uh, the purpose of second language learning. And it actually is unachievable. You cannot be uh, another monolingual uh, native first language speaker in, 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 in a new language. It just won't work. You will be a bilingual if you uh, um, uh, achieve that. Uh, so what do bilinguals and multilinguals typically do? And you know how do we tell if uh, if someone is bilingual or not? Well, uh, they clearly they are um, they they mix and switch between their languages. They have ability to decide which language to speak, to whom, and when, and how. You know these are the uh, kind of classic. Uh, questions sociolinguists typically ask. So when, when we say, okay, we want to move from a monolingual native L1 speaker's model in second language learning to a bilingual multilingual model, then we need to think, okay, what do they typically do? They're not typically uh, separating the, uh, the language. They can, of course, if they want to, but they actually in, uh, in uh, everyday life typically mix and switch uh, um, uh, between uh, these different languages. Do we, do we ever teach people how to switch and mix languages? We don't do that. We have an ideological uh, fix on one language at a time or one language only. And this is uh, actually, interestingly, um, a, uh, an age of debate in second language acquisition. 
uh, that is the role of uh, the first language in second or foreign or additional language learning. Uh, quite often, the first language is seen as a negative source uh, uh, in learning or negative factor in learning. Somehow it's, it, it interferes with, with uh, 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 higher achievement in second uh, language uh, acquisition. So the transfer is quite often uh, negative learner errors are usually seen as caused by first language uh, influence. Uh, and if you look at the bilinguals uh, uh, in a holistic way, it's as if uh, you are asking them to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, perform a, uh, a task that re really requires two hands, but somehow you want to uh, um, uh, uh, you know, tie the one hand uh, at the back or you know, seeing the world through, or through one eye uh, only. So you, we quite often see situations where the teachers actually quite sp uh, explicitly ask the learners to forget their first language as if the first language is always there to interfere in the negative way. Now, uh, a second route, very different uh, route to the concept of uh, um, translanguaging, as I said, when, when uh, um, Colin Baker created uh, the term translanguaging, he basically uh, uh, added trans, the prefix, uh, to the concept of languaging, which has been ex in existence for a very long time in, in, in the uh, um, linguistics literature. Um, in anthropological linguistics, for example, Pete Becker um, uh, borrowed the uh, uh, term languaging from, uh, uh, from uh, Latin American uh, um, uh, scholars uh, uh, and, and argued that there is no such a thing as language, only continual languaging, an act that all of us human beings in the world engage in on an everyday basis. And he really wanted to push us to think that uh, uh, language is, shouldn't be regarded as an accomplished fact or as a, as a, as a thing that is already kind of fixed and, and finished, but as a process of being made. And that's uh, a, a very important uh, um, argument there in anthropological linguistics. Uh, in second language uh, acquisition, um, uh, people uh, will be familiar with the uh, sociocultural theory, especially Miro Swain's work on uh, languaging, where she talked about the cognitive process of negotiating and producing uh, meaning uh, meaningful and uh, sorry, just a minute. Meaningful, comprehensible output as part of language learning as a means to mediate cognition. What 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 is really interesting is her way of connecting the notion of languaging in, in, in her case it's very much about uh, metalinguistic uh, uh, commentary uh, so you'll be able to talk about language talk it through and the thinking process so uh, the meaning making process the problem solving process so advanced uh, uh, second language learners in 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 her studies she typically studies advanced second language learners, their cognitive and affective engagement through languaging, the process of languaging, whereby language serves as a vehicle through which thinking is articulated. Uh, and, and that's really uh, um, an interesting connection that she's making la between languaging and thinking and cognizing and, and, and consciousness that I really uh, uh, liked and I wanted to uh, expand. So, you know, some of the questions that are raised by this particular part of the literature on uh, uh, languaging is, how is the thinking process affected by simultaneous use of multiple languages? You know, what is the thinking process if you are if we are switching between different uh, um, uh, languages or mixing them uh, together in one utterance? And beyond advanced second language learners, uh, how can we include different types of bilingual language and uh, multilingual language users? Because we know people have very different experiences with their different languages, and to capture their talking it through in multiple languages, however incomplete, 
or truncated one's knowledge of individual uh, um, languages may be, is there any way to capture that through a concept like uh, um, uh, translanguaging? Well, translanguaging, of course, is uh, uh, aimed at uh, capturing the entirety of the learner's linguistic repertoire, rather than the knowledge of specific structures in specific languages uh, separately, and that's really important. I said within each of these uh, uh, broad approaches, there's, uh, there are some subtle uh, uh, differences. And uh, one um, uh, uh, group of people uh, that have been working uh, quite uh, intensively on uh, the idea of languaging are these uh, so-called um, distributed cognition and distributed language scholars. And they're typically associated with these two uh, journals, uh, Ecological Psychology and Language Sciences. And Nigel Love, who used to be uh, an editor of Language Sciences, I'm on the Ashura board uh, as well. Uh, is very much um, a, a, a leader, a thought leader in the idea, in the uh, uh, research on languaging. Now, in this uh, um, body of uh, literature, languaging is seen as an assemblage of diverse material, biological, semiotic, and cognitive properties and capacities, which languaging agents, otherwise known as uh, uh, speakers or language users, orchestrate in real time and across a diversity of time scales. Orchestrate is a really important metaphor here, it's an important verb, but it's also a metaphor. It's because we are talking about meaning making through elements of uh, different languages, but also elements of each uh, language, there are sound, there, are, there, there, there may be words, uh, uh, there are morpho syntax and, and, and the meaning and their uh, uh, pragmatic use uh, as well. And orchestration is basically by making uh, sound, making meaning, uh, making harmony through different uh, instruments and instrumentalities of different means, but actually come together in a coordinated and co uh, coherent way. Now, distributed language scholars set out to challenge what they call the code view of language. Language is not simply an abstract code, and uh, uh, they, they're not interested in identifying uh, abstract patterns. Um, you can't divorce these uh, uh, abstract structural, uh, structures from the cognitive, affective, and bodily dynamics in real time. Uh, and uh, uh, distributed language scholars are not interested in specifying the rules for mapping uh, forms onto meaning and meaning uh, uh, onto form, but actually the process of, uh, of making meaning. And they regard language as a second order construct, the product of first order activity languaging. So you, you have, we are always engaged in languaging, whatever is produced, it may be a structure uh, that one, some people may be interested in studying, but the focus uh, here is very much on the process of meaning making, which is languaging, and language is the out outcome of that. So human languaging activity is radically heterogeneous and involves the interaction of processes on many different time scales, including neural, bodily, situational, social, and cultural processes and events. And so in this kind of formulation, which gives uh, primacy uh, to language over uh, what is lang uh, to, to languaging or over to what is language or the outcome of, uh, of languaging, um, uh, you don't dis distinguish the so-called uh, linguistic, paralinguistic, non-linguistic, uh, or th these conventional uh, distinctions don't uh, uh, make any uh, uh, sense. So they think they want want us to think of language not as an organism-centered uh, entity 
not a brain sim simply based uh, on in the brain or on the brain uh, with with uh, the formula uh, formalism uh, the formal structures like morphemes words and sentences but as a multi-scalar organization of different processes that in body enables the bodily and situated to interact with situation and transcending again the the the, the word transcending is really important transcending cultural historical dynamics and, and, and practices. So the divides between the linguistic, paralinguistic and extra linguistic dimensions of human communication are then made nonsensical. So when I'm talking, the my my tone of voice, uh, my facial expression, my my uh, hand gesture, even though I'm doing this online, you can't quite see, but I'm actually making all sorts of gesture. Uh, and of course, uh, in, in a person interaction, uh, you will see the body posture uh, as well. They are all meaningful and they all coordinate and they all come together without uh, one of uh, which uh, would be a different meaning. So this orchestration of neural bodily worldly skills of languaging is uh, is what we need to uh, focus on is the is the holistic approach but it's uh, also the coordinated approach. And of course the importance of feeling, experience, history, memory, subjectivity, culture, and even ideology and power all come into this uh, as well. And on language learning, the uh, languaging scholars, if you like, uh, have a particular take on what language learning is about. So they're, they're saying that the novice or the learner, if you like, does not acquire language, rather they adapt their bodies and brains to the languaging activity that is surrounding them. So uh, in some sense, they're saying we have the innate capacity of learning and using uh, linguistic resources to make meaning, but in different contexts, in different uh, co uh, cultures, in different communities, we have to adapt the way we use the linguistic material we have to do we have to do that if, even within the same language if you like you know whether it's polish or chinese or arabic or english uh, uh, different communities may speak with different accent but different professional contexts may be using the same language in different styles and different registers and different ways we have to when we change a job we have to adapt the way we communicate with other people to suit the institutional uh, culture as well. And in doing so, they participate in cultural worlds and learn that they can get things done with others in accordance with the culturally promoted norms and values. So it's very much this language socialization uh, idea and uh, also connected to the complex uh, dynamic uh, systems uh, uh, theories there. So uh, translanguaging really intends to transform the way we conceptualize and talk about language. Uh, first of all, uh, the boundaries between named languages, as I mentioned, whether it's English or, or, or German or Dutch, uh, these are uh, somewhat uh, uh, more closely related languages, or Polish, Arabic, Chinese, uh, Norwegian, which may or may not have any uh, uh, close relationship at all, structurally speaking. Uh, they are uh, socio-political and historical realities that we have to recognize. Yeah, if you look at the Scandinavian uh, uh, languages, I mean, that's clearly a socio-political and historical construct in, in some sense, it's not purely uh, uh, structural and purely linguistic, if you like, but if you uh, look at some other uh, um, uh, cases, whether it's in Italy or, 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 or China or somewhere else where you have these mutually unintelligible varieties of, uh, of the language, but nevertheless called the same uh, uh, language or part of the same language or dialects of the same language, actually can't understand each other. Again, these are socio-political and historical realities. Now, the human brain area responsible for language is the same for all named languages. 
Yeah, you don't have, say, Polish listed uh, or stored in one part of the brain and, uh, and your English in another part of the brain, it's in the same part of the brain. And though the, the same part of the brain that is responsible for language is also responsible for other cognitive functions like memory, uh, uh, attention, uh, emotion. And that, that's why when, when people do psycholinguistic research, they always pay attention to these aspects. And recent, uh, recent uh, years, uh, last uh, uh, 10, 15 years, there's such a surge in the interest of emotion in psycholinguistic acquisition because people realized, uh, it's always there of course, but recent, more recently people realized actually the brain area responsible for language is also the same area responsible for emotions as uh, it is for, for other cognitive functions like memory and uh, attention. Now the cognitive representation and language awareness are outcomes of socialization experience and therefore fundamentally social. What that uh, is saying is, okay, the brain can tell certain sounds belonging to a named language. Okay, this sound is typically associated with the, say, the Polish speaking people. So this is a feature of the Polish language as opposed to Arabic or as opposed to English. Yeah, but that is very much that may be a cognitive representation, if you like, and certainly language awareness. But that is an outcome of a socialization experience. Yeah, if you if you are born into uh, one uh, language community and never had any other uh, language experience or cultural experience, you wouldn't actually uh, uh, know the difference. You wouldn't realize, okay, this uh, this sound or this particular feature belongs to Polish only and not other. Uh, uh, languages. Only when you have the la language content, multilingual experience, you will then realize actually these are unique, these are shared, and that's very much a, a, an outcome of a so, uh, socialization experience, and therefore fundamentally, uh, um, this, the so-called cognitive representation is fundamentally a, a social experience. So. Uh, 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 translanguaging in that sense really raises some fundamental issues about the modularity uh, uh, of minds. Here are some uh, stereotypical uh, uh, illustration of how uh, uh, people think of the brain, uh, the human brain, but actually we're talking about the same uh, areas. It's not, the, the human brain is not uh, uh, divided in, in, in this way. It, it, absolutely not. There is absolutely no uh, um, uh, reality, uh, uh, psychological or neurological reality uh, whatsoever. The scientific evidence points quite the opposite. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, human beings are socialized into community language, uh, uh, community society or nation specific ways of using sets of linguistic structural features. I mean, there is the, of course, the universal uh, uh, grammar, minimalist uh, um, uh, linguistics and, and generative linguistics uh, uh, theories, all that, whether you like it or not, it is absolutely true. Uh, there are sets of linguistic features and structures that are shared across all uh, uh, named languages. There are lots of features that are not shared, of course. It is the linguists that classify them into named uh, uh, languages. And then the, uh, uh, that, that's based on uh, observation of what is happening in communities and societies, of course. And human beings are socialized into community, uh, society, and nation based ways of using uh, uh, sets of linguistic structures. Uh, but in meaning and sense making, we do not think of the name first. Uh, and, uh, and for those who, uh, who know more than one named language, they switch between and mix them dynamically for meaning and sense making. You, you don't say, okay, I am going to uh, uh, say the next word in another language. I think of the label of uh, or the name of the language first before you want to make meaning. Bilinguals and uh, multilinguals typically 
uh, draw on whatever uh, comes out uh, first. We don't quite understand the cognitive processes of coming up with uh, uh, um, uh, utterances that uh, mix uh, uh, elements from different languages just yet, because uh, you know uh, science hasn't quite got there yet. We are beginning to to tackle into uh, that uh, those questions uh, with some uh, new uh, experimental techniques. But on the whole, you know, we we absolutely know that people, uh, um, uh, you know, linguists can analyze uh, mixed um, code utterances into uh, uh, different named languages, but speakers don't think of the names of languages first when, when they're mixing uh, them up. Now, that doesn't say that uh, translanguaging uh, uh, denies the existence of name theory. It doesn't really matter how many times we uh, uh, repeat that. People uh, accuse us, say, oh, you, you, you think uh, name languages don't exist. We, we say they absolutely do exist, uh, but, we want to emphasize that languages are historical, political, and ideological defined entities, as I uh, described. You know, you can you can draw on these stereotypical contexts like Scandinavian languages or Chinese languages, and you know they they are deeply historical, political, and ideological. But also other languages. Again, you from a historical evolution perspective, we know. Uh, um, that in historical linguistics and uh, work on uh, language evolution that shows all human languages evolved from fairly simple combination of sounds, gesture, icons, and symbols. And there are um, lots of research evidence from new neuroscience that differently named languages are not represented or controlled by different parts of the brain. That's very, you know, uh, uh, clear from the science literature. And efforts to identify or lo locate a language switch, as it were, in the brain uh, has never been uh, very successful. So. So in some sense, the, the uh, translanguaging perspective helps to uh, redefine a multilingual as someone who is aware, very much aware of the existence of the political entities of named languages, has acquired some of their structural features that belong to these differently named languages and has an ability to use them appropriately in specific context. That's what we call a multilingual or bilingual multilingual. Um, in terms of language learning, uh, uh, translanguaging uh, uh, colleagues following uh, the languaging idea um, uh, defines this as uh, uh, to socialize oneself into a different way of using specific linguistic uh, uh, structures and features. This is uh, like you know any kind of uh, language learning, uh, language acquisition. You want to socialize into a specific way uh, or a different way of using certain linguistic structures. And the structures may be the same, uh, but you have to uh, uh, use it differently. It, uh, it can only, uh, it not only applies to different communities, societies, nations, and cultures, but also different age groups, generations, gender, social groups, professional uh, professions and workplaces all have different styles and different ways of using uh, language. So in that sense, language learning is truly lifelong uh, experience as well. Now, just a couple of uh, uh, remarks on the political labeling of, uh, of language because it impacts on language learning and education. There are real social consequences when we name a language as native language or as a foreign language or as a first, second or, or, or additional language. There are real consequences uh, of that because we are assigning status, we're assigning social hierarchies to different languages and to the speech speakers of different uh, uh, of, of these languages. So if you call somebody a foreign uh, language speaker or, or even a second language speaker, or if you call somebody's language as uh, an immigrant language or minority language, you are also categorizing uh, the users of those languages uh, um, uh, in the social political sense. So there are real social uh, consequences of that. So, so in some sense, transcending the boundaries between named languages, rethinking and challenging the 
labels of named languages is about equity and uh, social justice, especially in the uh, education arena for minoritized uh, um, and disadvantaged um, uh, learners. So moving on to uh, uh, education. So we said translanguaging uh, helps us to rethink and talk about language in a different way. It also, uh, as the origin uh, originators of, of the concept, uh, like Ham Williams, Colin Baker, and also the earlier researchers like Ophelia Garcia, uh, um, have always been uh, focusing on, which is education, especially the education of, uh, of uh, minoritized and racialized bilingual uh, learners. It helps us to, uh, or urges us to uh, rethink uh, and to try to find alternative ways of talking about uh, education. Now, if education is about knowledge construction, does the uh, language in which knowledge is constructed matter? So if we say, okay, learning, education, schooling is about constructing knowledge, so if somebody has already acquired some knowledge, say in Arabic or in, in, in French or in German, does that matter when it comes to an learning something in another language? Does the language in which knowledge is constructed matter? Does the cultural context in which knowledge system is constructed matter? What is the impact uh, of pedagogical practices and classroom interaction on knowledge construction, the way teacher talk uh, uh, um, is managed, is delivered. Does that matter? The, the way teacher asks questions, for example, or the way uh, teacher makes use of the uh, uh, learner's prior knowledge? And what is the role of prior knowledge? Now, interestingly, these are uh, uh, some of the questions that have been asked more broadly in, in education, but not always specifically in bilingual education or language education. And in fact, people tend not to ask uh, those things and focus a, a bit too much on uh, uh, structures of, of language. Now, learners of bilingual an immigrant uh, or minority background have their funds of knowledge in their languages already acquired uh, uh, prior to learning additional languages and acquired in very specific cultural context. That's something that we really must remind ourselves. They don't come empty brained as it were. They have funds of knowledge uh, that or they already uh, possess, acquired in specific contexts through specific languages as well. The knowledge they have already acquired impacts on the knowledge, on the way they acquire new knowledge in a different language. That is something really important. So going back to the uh, um, uh, issue of transfer, there is plenty of new research evidence to show that transfer goes both ways, and uh, well, multiple ways, in fact, and it definitely can be positive and negative. Uh, uh, it, it's not only negative, and we have to, uh, um, you know, as as instructors or teachers, educators, we should make better use or more positive use of prior, learners' prior knowledge that includes knowledge gained in uh, um, uh, their first language or other languages, prior languages. So this uh, um, uh, um, brings me to uh, uh, some of the work uh, um, Edward Brandmeier, uh, an American uh, educator and education scholar, uh, has been doing, and I'm really uh, interested in, in his work on co-learning and what he calls pedagogy of vulnerability. And it is about repositioning the teacher vis-a-vis -vis the uh, uh, learner. It's very much uh, about symbolic uh, power relations. So in his formulation of co-learning, all knowledge in whatever language um, it is um, uh, acquired is valued. And there is reciprocal value of knowledge sharer. 
So, so in, in teaching and learning, uh, we don't distinguish a uh, uh, holder of knowledge and uh, transmitter and then recipient of, of, of knowledge, but actually it's a process of co-construction of knowledge. Therefore, uh, we all are uh, uh, knowledge sharers. We share uh, knowledge and we uh, re respect and value each other's knowledge. And we care for each other as people, as co-learners, and this is all about trust and about learning uh, from one another. So he formulated this in terms of pedagogy of vulnerability from a, from a teacher's point of view. And he urges teachers to open oneself up, contextualize that self in the societal construct and systems. We all come with our own traditions and, and cultural background and uh, community uh, uh, background and context and, and you know, values as well. We uh, need to admit what we don't know. And there are lots of things we don't know. We are a human after all, and we are prepared to co-learn, learn with uh, uh, our students. And we need to take risks, that includes risks of self-disclosure, to say, well, we don't, I don't know that, I don't have the uh, uh, answer, I don't know what is correct, uh, and I'm here to learn with you. Uh, uh, take the risks of change, of not knowing, of failing, but fundamentally value the knowledge, values, and insights of everybody involved in the process of a knowledge construction. And also unlearn, unlearn the cultural conditions that we've experienced and dismantle this asymmetrical uh, power relationship. And translanguaging and co-learning are, are, are very keen uh, uh, to each other because we value uh, all languages. Translanguaging is very much about valuing all languages and the knowledge gained in all languages. We want to learn each other's languages and perspectives on the world that is gained through different languages. And we want to create opportunities of different ways of learning and talking about learning is transforming the language that we use in, in, in teaching and learning. Um, just uh, 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 very quickly to uh, go through some uh, practical points, it's really important to, uh, to emphasize that translanguaging is not uh, additive, it's not about adding something just simply by adding or not uh, simply about allowing different languages to be used in, uh, in, in the classroom. It is really aimed at fundamentally transforming, transforming and reconstitutive, reconstituting the uh, language status, uh, challenging, transforming and reconstitutive of uh, language status and challenging, transforming and reconstituting uh, uh, language ideologies, really asking critical questions about ideologies uh, and re uh, uh, um, uh, constitutive of authorities and power relations in learning uh, um, as well. And uh, in terms of translanguaging or transforming uh, um, education, Nelson Mandela uh, uh, said famously, education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world and change uh, uh, people. Uh, it, it should not be uh, uh, an instrumental, uh, a purely instrumental thing, uh, as uh, one of our former uh, failed Secretary of State for Education in the UK said, you know, uh, learning and education is all to uh, get you uh, a meaningful job, whatever that means. Um, you can see the different uh, uh, values there. Now, practical challenges. Um, yes, when we are doing, uh, uh, when we are um, doing language uh, uh, teaching and learning, or we're managing uh, linguistically diverse classrooms, uh, uh, teachers quite often uh, feel like students have too many uh, different native languages, first languages, um, obviously more than what the teacher uh, him or herself can understand. How do I manage a linguistically diverse pool of uh, uh, learners in the in the same classroom? So I think again, 
this is uh, the, the key message here. You know, it's not just about uh, rethinking of language, but rethinking what education is about. Education is not about uh, the language alone, even in language education. It is about knowledge construction, particularly how language, how knowledge is constructed. And I said uh, before, you know, the, the, uh, the language in which knowledge is constructed really, really matters. Do they know? So we can ask uh, ourselves uh, with regard to, the, to our, our students, do they know the concept or method or fact or reasoning already in their first languages, whatever that may be? If yes, do they think they know uh, what they know is different from uh, what the textbook and teachers tells them? Uh, in, in the additional language, within the new language, within the target language they're, they're, they're learning now, and what's the difference? In that kind of practical way, you can actually develop better language awareness of both languages, the languages they already know, and the language they're, uh, they're learning, and developing critical thinking skills uh, and, and cri uh, criticality uh, um, overall in general. Another practical uh, issue uh, quite often raised by educators is I need to maximize input in of the target language, especially in the language classroom with fixed uh, limited uh, period of time. How, how am I uh, going to allow uh, so many different languages to be used? As I say, it's not just about allowing uh, uh, different languages to be used. Real learning, especially language learning, actually, requires use in context. You have to accept the classroom learning is by definition very, very limited, actually rather superficial. You know, deep learning, real learning doesn't happen in the 40, 50, an hour, you know, whatever minutes maybe uh, um, uh, that you know constructed uh, and instructed uh, uh, learning. The monolingual approach to language learning has not been proven to be very effective. Quite honestly, there is no no evidence that is uh, uh, particularly uh, effective. Um, effective um, bilingual multilingual approach to language learning actually maximizes the learner's potential as Ken Williams originally argued. That was the key thing that started the whole uh, 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 movement, if you like, of, of, of translanguaging, and that is really uh, important. And another important consideration is the long-term consequence of putting down once uh, uh, L1s, if you like. So there are, there, the, it would really damage people's attitude or at least form negative attitude towards one's uh, um, uh, first language. It, will re it can lead to register loss. So, you know, we, we have seen uh, uh, fairly advanced uh, uh, language learners of, of second or uh, additional four languages that actually, uh, uh, you know, can operate uh, in certain uh, registers uh, in, in the um, uh, new language, but actually can't do that, do the same register in their, in their first language anymore. So that's uh, always uh, an, uh, an interesting issue to explore. And again, uh, relatively understudied. Um, and we also know from the uh, uh, psychological literature, psycholinguistic literature, that inhibition or suppression impacts on the cognitive processing as well as emotion. So uh, I think there are much wider considerations that we have to have. Translanguaging really, in summary, aims to develop a holistic and equitable view of multilingualism. Uh, uh, minority uh, and minoritized languages absolutely matter. The multilingual uh, capacity, or what uh, uh, my um, dear friend and, and the late um, uh, Vivian Cook uh, uh, talked about uh, in terms of linguistic multi-competence, really going beyond the language dimension to factor uh, sensory embodied and perceptual cognitive skills into uh, uh, the, uh, the equation. So it, it's that multimodal uh, um, dimension that needs to be uh, considered. And ultimately, um, Translanguaging aims to foster creativity through novel ways of combining mixing language structures, creating new expressions, and criticality, different ways of thinking, different ways of doing, different traditions, practices, values, and different ideologies. Now, 
both creativity and criticality are absolutely key in my mind to what education is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. Thanks a lot. Um, we are now open, the, um, the talk now is open for discussion. So we do invite questions